Now, don't be too hard on James and John. Don't be too hard on those, who, those two disciples who asked Jesus to grant that they could sit at his right hand and at his left in the kingdom. After all, what they saw, not much different than what we seek, because what they saw was to be near to Jesus, to be close to his power and glory, to share in his power and glory. And what is it that we seek? What is it that believers seek? Well, believers talk about getting to heaven, dwelling in the presence of God, being near to the glory of God, which is pretty much what James and John saw. So, don't be too hard on them. I guess you could say what we're talking about with James and John is the desire for upward mobility, spiritual upward mobility. They wanted to move up spiritually, get to the top of the spiritual ladder. They were spiritually ambitious, and so they asked to be named executive vice presidents of the kingdom and have offices right next to the boss's office and keys to the executive washroom, as somebody else has put it. And why not? Why not? Along with Simon Peter, James and John were Jesus' closest associates, assistants, the ones whom Jesus selected to witness his transfiguration, accompany him to the Garden of Gethsemane, the ones whom Jesus seemed to rely on the most, and in whom he confided. So why should their ambition have been to continue in those roles throughout eternity? Why not ask to be moved up a bit spiritually? Of course, when you and I think about upward mobility, we usually don't think of it in spiritual terms. Rather, we think about people moving up the corporate ladder, getting promoted, finding better paying jobs, buying a nicer home or car, moving up the economic scale, and providing a better life for their children. When I grew up in the 1950s, that was the goal of many middle class families, to move up in the world, create better opportunities for their children than they had had, make sure their children were better off than they were. The middle class of the 1950s had survived both the Great Depression and World War II, and they were determined to create a better lives for themselves and their children. So they worked hard at their jobs, bought their first homes, emphasized education, their children getting perhaps a college degree, a degree that they never got. My brother and I knew from the start what our parents' goal was for us, and we had no choice, pretty much. It was college and a better life. So they worked hard, expected us to work hard and do well in school. The desire for this upward mobility shaped lives in the 1950s, but it continues to shape lives today. Just look at the young occupants in expensive homes in new subdivisions. And consider how often people in their 20s and 30s change jobs and listen to them talk about their hopes and plans and dreams. The ambition to, ambition to move up, to do better, is alive and well. And actually, it's what many people are after spiritually. Upward mobility. I mean, in one sense, what else is the desire to get to heaven than the desire for the ultimate promotion, the ultimate move up? And all the people who seek to deepen their spirituality, feel closer to God, do what Jesus would have done. The same desire as at work. We often approach spirituality like we do everything else. <laughs> that same desire for upward mobility. Kind of like James and John. And in some respects, this ambition is good. And it can lead to people seeking God, learning Christ more and more. The only problem is that when we truly learn Christ, we learn that he recommended the exact opposite approach. Not upward mobility, but downward mobility. That's the wild contradiction at the heart of the Christian life. If we want to move up spiritually, then we have to move down. If we want to be great, Jesus said, 
Well, then we must pick up the water pitcher, start serving at tables. If we want to be first, then we have to go to the back of the line and be last. If we want to be near to God, then we must take our eyes off heaven and focus our gaze on those who are going through hell. And if we want to find our spiritual self, then we have to forget ourselves. If we want to have all things spiritual, then we must let go of all things and give ourselves away in love. It's the wild contradiction. To move up spiritually, we have to move down to servitude. And that's what the disciples just couldn't understand. But I'm not sure if we can really understand it either. Because it's not the way we see the world. Let's face it, for us the world is set up in terms of power. Political power, military power, economic and corporate power. And the world is run from the top by those in power. It's just the way we see it. The president, CEO, a boss. They are the ones who are in charge of the way things go. Those at the bottom have no power at all. No say so. And so we think if we have to change, if we want to change things, then we must start at the top, because that's where the power is. So California tries to recall their governor. CEOs are booted out. Every four years, we decide whether to keep the incumbents in or kick the bums out. That's how change occurs, we think, from the top down. And that's exactly how the disciples saw Jesus and the kingdom. They figured Jesus was about to replace those at the top, throw the bad guys out, and set up an entirely new administration that would finally change them so that God would be in charge. And James and John wanted to be part of that new administration, that new management team, help Jesus change things, change the world. It's what they've been hoping for as disciples of Jesus. And now at last, the chance for real change was at hand. Jesus would now be in power, at the top, and they wanted to be there with him and have some power themselves, power to work, different kind of world. And in that sense, James and John actually showed great faith. They believed Jesus would triumph and usher in a new way of doing things. And yet, that's not the way it works, Jesus said. The new world will not be set up just like the old world. As one author has put it, the new world is not remotely like the old one. It turns the old one upside down. The number ones are not the powerful ones having their pictures taken at the head of the table. They are the quiet ones slipping in and out among the guests, refilling wine glasses and laying down clean silverware for the next course. The great ones are not the dignitaries to the right and left of the ruler. They are the servants who are stirring pots in the kitchen, testing the temperature of the soup so that it is neither too hot nor too cold for honored guests. James and John want Jesus to hurry up and be king, become king of the world. But he has other things on his mind. Has everyone been served? Is all the food on the table? Does anyone need anything? That's how the new world works. The thing is, Jesus wasn't a king in the disguise of a servant, waiting for his big moment, waiting to reveal his true nature when the time came to grab power at the top. He was a servant through and through. He even tells James and John that he doesn't have the power or the authority to grant them their request. That power and authority belongs to God alone. And Jesus doesn't serve because he knows he's going to be rewarded. He doesn't play at being a servant, knowing that a promotion is just in the offer. He serves out of love for God, and he's in it for the love of God, and serves God knowing there is no reward. Whatever else happens will be done only by God's grace and power. Now whether you and I will ever be able to understand this really, I don't know. Because it's so radically different than the way we see things, and the way our world is. 
as that author mentioned and suggested, maybe the best thing to do is just keep looking at, to the example of power Jesus gave. The giving himself away for our sakes. His serving us and feeding us day after day. And hold on to that mystery. And whether we can make sense of it or not, trust the truth that serving is how the world will be transformed. Not from the top down, but from the bottom up. And frankly, we've seen the truth of that again and again in our world, the power of serving, the power of giving ourselves away for love's sake. Most of the transformations in this world that have resulted in reconciliation among peoples, given hope for a new way of living, new possibility for life, brought about change, have actually been brought about by individuals who were servants and were willing to risk themselves for love's sake. The greatest transformations actually have come from the bottom up through serving. And it truly is how the world is transformed. And maybe that should be our greatest ambition. Not to move up, but hey, move down until at last we are next to Christ and near to God. Amen. Amen.